could mean that there's been an animal nearby. You're looking for bear scratches on the trees. You are listening really closely to make sure that there aren't any animals or something that might attack you nearby. All your senses are heightened. And when we go through the wilderness times of life, it's the same way. We seem to always respond with our senses. We're listening for every word, every sign that things are going to, okay, God's making a way. I'm going to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. But we forget. We forget the verse that Carrie just read, which is we're told to forget the former things. We don't forget the things, do we? The things are what we're paying attention to. And we end up forgetting God. Forget the former things, God says, but remember me. We need to remember God. We need to remember God and who he is and what he's doing more when we're in the wilderness than any other time in our lives. Just don't forget God. In Psalm 106, the story is recounted of the children of Israel wandering. And it's after they've been gone through the Red Sea and God has parted that. And now they're searching for the Holy Land, for that promised land, and they're wandering and wandering. And when I read this account, it really floored me. So just, just listen. After it talks about all the steps that they'd made, then it says, they forgot God, their very own savior, who turned things around in Egypt. They found fault with the life they had and turned a deaf ear to God's voice. To me, that was just stunning, because I'm reading through this and I think, wait a minute. These are actually the people who walked with their very own feet through, through that Red Sea when it was parted. They're the ones that could see the ocean being held back. These are the very people who have tasted manna. These are the very people who saw that cloud lead them by day and the fire lead them by night. I mean, they have experienced God's miracles, and yet... They're not doing what he tells them, tells them to do in the moment. And I just thought, what do you mean they forgot their very own Savior who turned things around in Egypt? How is that even possible? How could they find fault with the life they had? Couldn't they see that God would take care of them? Like he'd been doing all these things for them? And then it hit me. I thought, wow. Wow, God, that is a picture of me. I am the one who... No matter how many times God works miracles in my life, I seem to forget about it. And whenever I find myself in the wilderness, I say, yeah, okay, so you did that. So you parted the Red Sea. So you provided food in the desert. But this is different because now I have a medical issue or a relational issue or a financial issue or whatever it is that might be going on in your life. And you say, yeah, God, but I've never seen you do this. And I don't know if you're going to do it. I don't know if you can. And so we start trying to find our own way out. In other words... We're the ones who forget who God is. And we find fault with the life we live. We say, ah, oh, I'm not going to be here, God. I refuse to stay in this place. And we forget to remember God. Have you ever felt like you're forgetful? Just thought you're a forgetful person? Or maybe lately you've been thinking you're more forgetful than you used to be? Am I the only one that sometimes goes in a room and thinks, wait, why am I here? Me. What was I doing? What was I doing? I'm raising my hand. They, they're liars. <laughs> But I'm raising my hand here at church. I forget my keys in my wallet every day. I can remember the score of a ball game from 30 years ago, but I can't remember my keys every single day. True story. Every day. Hey, do you know where my keys are? As he's walking out the door. So I'm not telling. You think since I'm so in touch with God, he would tell me, but it doesn't work that way. I don't know. But that's how it goes, isn't it? We, we get and we're, we think, oh, we're just I'm just a forgetful person. But I'm going to give you a little test right now just to test your memory, okay? Here you go. Can you remember a time that you were mistreated? Can you remember a time that you were criticized? Might have been 30 years ago on the playground, but can you remember that time? Can you remember a time that you were left out? Can you remember a time that you were underappreciated? See, great news, you have really good memories, don't you? I bet there's not a person in here who couldn't think of a time that they've been hurt, that they've been wronged. I know that I can pull things up just like that. It could have been a lifetime ago, but yet I still, you know, back, in, back when I was a kid or in high school, all the way through, but I can remember. You can remember every word that was said on that playground. You can remember exactly what that person did to you at work eight years ago. See, we remember the tough stuff, 
We carry those hurts effortlessly, don't we? It's called carrying a grudge. Grudges are easy to carry, aren't they? I don't even have to try. I can carry a grudge so easily. But how long has it been since you carried a blessing? You carry a grudge, but can you carry a blessing? Can you remember right now a time that someone was unusually kind to you? That someone forgave you and you didn't deserve it? A time that someone reached out to you in generosity when you were desperate? Can we remember the good things as easily as remember the tough stuff? I think the reason that it's easier, much easier for me to remember the wrongs done to me than the rights is because somewhere, although I don't like to admit it, it shows that I guess I think that I actually deserve the good stuff. I mean, okay, I'm going to be a nice person. Good stuff should happen to me, right? But wrong me well there's something wrong with that that's undeserved why would that ever happen to me and yet i also conveniently forget the times that i've said something hurtful to someone else the times that i have not forgiven when i should have the times that i've been slow to forgive slow to love slow to be kind the times that i've seen an opportunity to reach out and help someone and i didn't because out of my selfish motives i was too busy all the things that i've done wrong i conveniently forget our memories are a big deal. What we remember and what we forget. If someone cuts you off in traffic, I mean, you're going along and suddenly someone just pulls right in front of you and you slam your horn on and your brakes and you're mad. You're mad. <laughs> How do you feel 30 miles down the road when you think of that again? Well, I mean, you can feel your blood pressure rising again, right? You're just like, oh, that, I mean, once again, you think, oh, I can't believe they did that. And you're still mad. But what if you are the one that misses the exit and at the last second you've got to get over or you're going to have to go you know, 15 miles down the road to the next turn and you need to get over at the last second and there's a long line but somebody lets you in. Well, what do you do? You just wave and slip in and go, oh, that's great and keep going. Are you still thinking 30 miles down the road? Wow, that was so great of that person. Wow, they are so kind. No, we never think about it again. Kindnesses done to us are forgotten. They're brushed off. But wrongs done to us, we carry, we hold on to. We pick that up and we carry it on and on and on. And when you're in the wilderness, it's really important what you remember and what you forget. And what we need to remember is God is at work in you. Look at this verse in Isaiah. It says, prepare for God's arrival. Make the road straight and smooth. A highway fit for God. Fill in the valleys, level off the hills, smooth out the ruts, clear out the rocks. Then God's bright glory will shine and everyone will see it. Yes, just as God has said. Here's the deal. In my flesh, I am the wilderness. I am the wilderness. I have valleys of selfishness that need to be filled in. I have mountains of pride that need to be leveled off. It turns out I am the wilderness that needs to be changed. Mm. When I'm in the world, world and wilderness and circumstances aren't right, I think change the circumstances. No, God cares a lot more about you than your circumstances. Mm -hmm. He cares a lot more about your character than your circumstances. He loves you. You know, Carrie and I have four kids, and there are lots and lots of times where our kids didn't get their way. If you're a parent, you get that. If you have parents, you get that. No, a loving parent does not give their kid, kids their way. Why? Well, if I have, if there's something that I can do to fulfill a desire of my kids, sure, I'm happy to do that unless I know that actually there's something better for them. There's something that they need in their lives that... Maybe they can't see it at the time. Maybe they can't understand it. And maybe I'll be misunderstood. Maybe I'll be maligned. But that's okay. No, you can't have cookies for breakfast. <laughs> Sorry. You got a zero on your homework because you left it at home. You know what? They're in third grade. Better to learn that lesson now. Right. Than when they're in high school or college. You let them sometimes take the hard knocks because you love them, because you know there's something they're going to need more in the future, because you have traveled that road and you know what they're going to need in their lives to come, and you're willing to let them feel pain, cry, feel hurt, know you can't go to the party that every other kid in the school is going to. Sorry. 
You say the hard no's. You say yes. But the yes is you, you respond in a way to make sure that the ultimate goal is achieved, and that is that your child grows to maturity. And in growing to maturity, you're going to be part of that. Now, there's only one way to get there, one way to get to maturity. Physical maturity, when you're born, your body grows, you're a baby, you're a toddler, you're a kid, teenager, an adult, you grow without even trying physically. But spiritual maturity, spiritual maturity is a result of one thing, the one thing that has to take place in the desert, and that is obedience. There's only one, it's the only path to growing spiritually. Spiritual maturity comes from obedience. And that's why you may know a high school age kid who is really spiritually mature. Why? Because they have learned the lesson of obeying. Mm. And there are a lot of adults I know who are 50, 60, 70 years old, and they are still spiritually babies in their maturity level because they've never learned this lesson. Mm. Never learned that we have a God and we obey him. The world doesn't revolve around us. Right. Carrie and I have um, our two oldest grandchildren, Ben and Joanna. Ben is in first grade and Joanna is in kindergarten. And so they're brother and sister. And a couple days ago, I got to pick them up from school. It's something I don't usually do, so it was fun for me. I picked them up from school. They got in the car and were driving home. And I said, so guys, tell me about your day. Tell me, what did you do today? What was the high of your day, the best thing? And Ben said, I got 20 greenies. I said, that's awesome. And what's a greenie? <laughs> and what is a greenie? You got 20 of them, but what is that? And he said, oh, there are these things, they are super hard to get. They are so hard to get. I said, well, how do you get them? Well, I mean, you just, there's all kinds of things you have to do to get them. But I mean, it's hard. It's really hard. It's like harder than getting a car. That's how hard it is to get 20 greenies. And I got 20 greenies. And I was like, amazing, Ben, you're amazing. Wow. I said, yeah, I've been working on it for a long time. And I said, what do you get for 20 greenies? So, oh, I get to do show and tell on Monday. So, okay. So I'm figuring out, okay, this is, you know, he must have been doing things. He's, you know, this is, I, I get it. Teacher's really onto something here. So he has 20 greenies. He's telling me how it's just, you know, it's like he's climbed Mount Everest. He's in first grade. Meanwhile, his sister, who's in kindergarten, Joanna, said, um, actually, they're not that hard to get. <laughs> I said, wait, what do you mean? I thought they were harder to get than a car. <laughs> Joanna said, oh, um, no. She said, actually, uh, you, and you don't have to do a lot of things. Ben's wrong on that. I said, wait, what do you mean? Ben said, no, you're wrong, Joanna. No, you have to do, I did all kinds of things to get that. She said, no. Um, you only have to do one thing. Um, all I do, and I have a whole lot of them, is I just listen to the teacher and I do what she says. <laughs> Joanna cracked the code in kindergarten. She's done it, and she apparently has this, you know, mile high pile of these greenies. You say, oh yeah, I've done this, this, this with them. And so during the week, Carrie and I have been talking preparing for this message, talking about it. And I was like, okay, God, I get it. I get it. You see, that's how I feel. I feel like Ben usually, because I think, okay, you know, spiritual growth, integrity, there's so many things, there's so many areas. You mean in my uh, in my finances, in my relationships, in, my, in every area of my life and dealing, I'm supposed to be doing all these things. And wow, this is just hard. And then Joanna just streamlined and simplified it for me. And it's like, no, we only need to do one thing. You just... Listen to God and obey Him. That's it. Just obey. Just obey God. You may be thinking, yeah, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do right now. Well, I found that a great place to start is with what I already know. Turns out that I already know a lot of things that I should be doing. It's just sometimes I don't feel like doing it, especially when I feel like I'm in the wilderness. And things like I should be spending time in His Word. And you may think, wait a minute, I know, but I open the Bible and there's like these names and places that I don't understand. It seems confusing. I get it. I honestly get this one because I did not grow up at church. I came very late to all of this. And so I can very easily remember opening the Bible and thinking everybody knows what they're talking about. I don't know any of these stories. I don't know who's Joseph, who's the, where, who, where are these people? Who are they? Where, how do they relate to each other? I'm telling you, 
Just start. Just start. Start, try reading Psalm 1 and go from there. Maybe a psalm a day. Psalm just means song. They're pretty short. And there's a lot of wisdom there. God will speak to you. Just start. Don't let that, uh, the enemy tell you that, oh, this is confusing. This isn't for you. You're God's child. This is for you. He will help you understand. He will make a way. So I encourage you, spend time in his word. Surround yourself with people who are. Do the things that you do know to do. Stop focusing on what is not happening and start focusing on what God is doing. Because this is the secret to staying obedient in the wilderness. Thank God for what he's doing while you're still in the wilderness. We think, well, when I get through this, boy, I'm going to thank you so much, God. Now start thanking him now. I think, well, wait, I don't have nothing. The thing I want to happen hasn't happened yet, so there's nothing to be thankful for. No, there's always something to be thankful for. There's always something. So stop looking for a way out of the wilderness and start watching and seeing what he's doing while you're in the wilderness. This takes intentionality and discipline because it's a lot easier to keep saying, nope, you still haven't done it. You still haven't done the thing I wanted you to do. Instead of seeing intentionally, looking around and saying, God, what are you doing? What are you doing today? In other words, it's really important when we're in the wilderness to change our focus. Change your focus from only watching for what he, you're looking for what he's not doing and noticing that and talking about that. Start noticing what he is doing, the miracles around you. How you spend your time in the wilderness really matters. When I was at one of the darkest points of my life after some devastating news several years ago, I just fell to my knees and God gave me this verse, which is Psalm 9, verse 1. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I thought, God, I can't think of one good thing in this situation. I can't think of one. There's nothing here. But I'm going to take you at your word, God. I trust you. I'm going to take you at your word. And so I got a blank book out. And I wrote this verse on the first page. I said, God, I'm watching Okay, you have my attention. I am watching you. I'm going to write down what you do do. Not what you don't, but what you do. I'm going to watch for your miracles, little miracles every day, wherever they are, wherever they happen. I'm going to watch for them, and I'm going to write them down because I know that I have a personal bent toward forgetfulness. I forget the good stuff. Even if I do notice it, I'll forget it. So I thought, I'm going to write this down. And I wrote the date at the top of the next blank page the next morning and said, okay, God, fill it up. I'm going to write down everything you do today. I'm going to write down where I see you moving. And that night, sure enough, there, there was one little thing I could write down. I said, okay, God, I thank you for this. Okay, do it again, God. Do it again tomorrow. Next morning, get up, write the date at the top of the page. Have this blank page and say, okay, God, I'm waiting. I'm watching you. I am watching for you. You better believe that my senses were heightened. They were sharp, and I was watching for God to move. There wasn't a kindness that escaped me. I noticed every little thing and held on to it, clung on to it. Okay, God, that's you. You're moving. Okay. Every night, I thank God. I say, thank you, God, for today. Thank you. Look what you did today. Okay, let's do it again. Do it again tomorrow, God. Over and over and over. And you know what? This is the key. There it is. It's really simple. Watch for the miracles God is doing in your life. It turns out you're the one that's changed. You'll be different. You are not going to walk out of the wilderness the same person you walked into it. When you walk into a wilderness, you're going to come out different. You're either going to come out more like Christ or less like Christ. And God's goal is for you to become more like his son. And we need to partner with God. The way we cooperate with him in that is we are faithful, obedient. We say, okay, God, I'm going to obey just for a day. I'm going to obey, obey day by day. I don't know the big picture. I don't even know about what the rest of the week, but today I'm going to obey you. You do what you know to do, and he will keep showing you the next thing that you need to do. When our oldest son, Ryan, was going to college, he was filling out his admissions. He had the big essay to write, and the question was this. It said, what is your worldview and why? And so Ryan asked me to proof it, and I did, and I 
before he turned it in for his college admissions. And I started reading, he said, my worldview is that there is a God, a creator, and he had a son, Jesus Christ. And God gave his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for me, for my sins, because I'm a sinner. And then he rose again, and he's alive in my life. And so the goal of my life is to tell about him, to worship him, to become more like him. And that was covered like in the first paragraph. But then he went on to say this. He said, I don't believe this because my parents do. And I don't believe it because I've ever seen a really big miracle because I haven't. I believe it because I have seen a thousand little miracles. A thousand little miracles. And he went on to say, I remember standing on uh, the steps of the, the, the stairs. Uh, and I was supposed to have been in bed. It was late one night. And uh, my parents, I saw my parents, and they were kneeling in front of the sofa, and they were praying. And they were just, you know, crying out to God. And I was, of course, really interested as a kid. I'm just listening, watching, uh, wondering what they were talking about. And, and you see, my parents had uh, planted a church not long before. There weren't very many people coming. I knew that uh, finances were tight, but I heard them praying and just saying, God, we trust you. We believe you. Please provide. Please work in these people's lives. Bring them, bring them close to you, God. And he said, and I saw him do it. I saw God do it. I've seen God move. And now this is my faith. It's not my parents' faith. It's my faith because I've seen a thousand little miracles in my life. And so I want you to stand. And we're going to sing a song right now. And as we do, I want you to think about what are the little miracles that God has done in your life. I want you to search your mind. Think about the thousand little miracles in your life that God has done and you have not noticed or not thanked him, maybe in the moment. Oh, this is a time for you to think about, really internalize this and think about oh, how has God worked in your life? Let's sing together. So I'm 